Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a new start time for us, 7 p.m., so we appreciate you making it out here. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. On behalf of my colleagues, we're thrilled to have you here at Greenspun uh, College. And as you can see, our colleagues in Greenspun College are recording the lecture, so it'll be up on YouTube in a few days. You can watch it on public television at 3 in the morning and, and a few other times. Uh, we wouldn't be here without our donors, so I always like to acknowledge the people who support us, including uh, Barrett Gold Corporation, Wolfgang Puck Enterprises, and as well as the individual donors uh, who support our efforts. Uh, we're here tonight to, uh, to welcome Tamara Wittes to campus, her first visit with us as a Brookings Scholar. She'll be talking on the, I guess I could call it almost provocative title of Can the United States Escape the Middle East? She's a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy. She's also has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. That was from November 2009 to January 2012, coordinating U.S. policy on democracy and human rights in the Middle East during the Arab uprisings. She also oversaw the Middle East Partnership Initiative and served as Deputy Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions. She holds a bachelor's degree in Judaic and Near Eastern Studies from Oberlin College and a master's and doctorate in government from Georgetown University. So we could not have a more informed uh, speaker to deliver a, another topical lecture that we've, we've brought you. I think this is our 110th topical lecture in a row on in, in public <laughs> policy. Uh, the stage is yours. Well, I, I want to start by thanking Bill and Caitlin and my wonderful hosts at Brookings Mountain West. Um, I have been hearing from my colleagues at Brookings in Washington about uh, Brookings Mountain West for years. Uh, and I've been at Brookings uh, with, aside from that stint in the State Department, I've been at Brookings since 2003. So for me to finally have a chance to come out here and uh, see it for myself is a real treat. Um, I'm overwhelmed by the passion and engagement of the students I've met. It's been a wonderful week so far, and I'm so grateful that we have this partnership with UNLV. So we gather tonight at what I see as an inflection point for American foreign policy um, and for America's role in the world more broadly. And I don't just mean the thing that makes tonight's uh, lecture topical. Uh, I don't just mean President Trump's sudden decision to pull U.S. troops out of Syria. We'll come to that in a minute. What I mean is something a bit broader. Um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States enjoyed a unipolar moment. It turned out it really was only a moment in historical terms. About 20 years in which the United States was the unchallenged dominant power in world affairs whether you measure it economically, militarily, or politically. And during this period, the institutions that the United States and its allies had set up after World War II achieved unprecedented goals, things we never dreamt were possible. The expansion of the European Union and NATO helped cement a Europe whole and free for the first time in modern history. The United Nations became a working forum for international engagement that advanced conflict resolution and genocide prevention and human development. Perpetrators of genocide in the Balkans were halted with collective international force and put on trial for war crimes in an international criminal court. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade became the World Trade Organization, setting new standards for fair market exchange and accelerating global economic interdependence. That helped lift millions of Chinese and Indians out of poverty, even as it left many Americans behind. And this period also turned out to be one in which the spread of democracy around the world reached new outer limits and then began to contract. And through all these developments, the United States, as Secretary of State Madeleine Albright termed it, was 
the indispensable nation. Where it led, others would follow, and if it didn't lead, others mostly did nothing. The Clinton administration ended the genocide in Bosnia, but failed to do so in Rwanda. And during this period, beginning in the 1990s, the United States also began to face a new and ultimately devastating threat from Al Qaeda and then from other violent Islamist groups. In 1998, they destroyed two of our embassies in Africa. And in 2001, they attacked New York and the Pentagon and nearly hit Washington with a plane that was forced down by heroes over Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Now, the 9-11 attacks led us into a war in Afghanistan, seeking to deny those terrorists a safe haven from which to plan to hit us again. And that war has now stretched on long enough that young men and women are being sent to fight it today who were just infants when it started. And this was a period as well in which the United States launched a war of choice in Iraq, a war that ended in a long drawn out standoff, it, rather a war that ended a long drawn off standout, standoff with a ruler who threatened his neighbors, a war that toppled a brutal dictator, but also a war that launched a brutal civil conflict and that helped spawn a new kind of terrorist threat that we still confront today. Being an unrivaled superpower doesn't mean that everything goes your way. And now that unipolar moment has passed. With Putin's consolidation of power in Russia, with the financial crisis that swept the US and Europe in 2008, and finally with the rise of a more assertive China under President Xi, that unipolar moment is over. But the wars we launched are not over. The threat of terrorism has not vanished. And the pressure for democratic freedoms among citizens living under repressive regimes also has not vanished. Now, even as our position in the world began to change, even as our own relative capabilities changed and other nations rose in strength, our extension of our efforts, our political, economic, military engagement in the, around the world hasn't demand, diminished. And so it's not a surprise in some ways that at this moment, a lot of Americans are questioning why we keep acting like the indispensable nation. Whether we're really all that indispensable or whether we're really all that special at all. And when it comes to that question of what the United States should and shouldn't be doing abroad, the Middle East comes up again and again. And right now, Syria is the topic at the top of the news. Now, back when I was in the government, in the State Department's Near East Bureau, back in August 2011, President Obama called for the ouster of Syria's President Bashar al-Assad. He said, Bashar, had lost the legitimacy to lead. His call came after Syrians had been peacefully protesting and getting shot at by their government for six months. But President Obama was not willing to commit many resources to achieve the objective that he articulated. When Bashar al-Assad repeatedly bombed his own civilians with chemical weapons, President Obama chose in September 2013 not to carry out his threat of a military strike in retaliation. But a year later, he did send American troops in small numbers into Syria. Why? In order to push back on the Islamic State, ISIS. That's why the United States, along with France, Britain, Australia, and a host of other countries, ended up in this alliance with the Syrian Kurdish-led militia called the Syrian Defense Forces. They were the ones who were willing to take the aid that we were willing to offer. They were willing to fight ISIS exclusively and not to fight Assad. And they fought and bled and died. And with our help, they won. 
achieving an end to ISIS rule on Syrian territory, and winning effective autonomy for a large portion of northeast Syria and the people, both Kurdish and Arab, who lived there. Now, what we've seen over the last 10 days or so, we've seen President Trump's decision to withdraw American troops from Syria, to do it hastily, without consultation with allies who were fighting alongside us on the ground, without consultation with our Kurdish partners, without any plan to preserve the gains that we and they achieved there. As a result of his decision, Turkey has invaded Syria to create a security zone for itself by expelling Syrian Kurds from their homes. And the Kurds, in response, have cut a deal with Bashar al-Assad in Damascus and with his Russian backer, Vladimir Putin, allowing Syrian and Russian forces to overrun this autonomous zone and protect the Kurds from the Turks. And meanwhile, today, American forces bombed our own munitions depot in an abandoned cement factory in northeast Syria to keep it from falling into others' hands. That's what retreat looks like. And last night, we watched 12 Democratic presidential candidates agree that while Donald Trump's decision was disastrous for American interests, they all want to end endless wars. And not a single one of them was willing to say that they would like to keep American forces in Syria. Now, what's the common thread here between President Obama's narrow restriction of American engagement in Syria to an anti-ISIS fight, President Trump's impulsive withdrawal of American forces, and the Democratic candidates' reluctance to consider keeping US forces in Syria despite the horrific consequences of their withdrawal. The common thread is a clear desire among American political leaders, Democratic and Republican, to do less in the Middle East. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that this reduced appetite is not just about ideology, it's not just about an isolationist impulse. It's not even just about the so-called exhaustion of the American public with endless wars. Rather, this appetite to do less reflects a deeper change, both in the dynamics of the Middle East and in broader American interests. It's a change that should affect our policies. Although the Middle East still matters to the United States, it matters markedly less than it used to. Now, unfortunately for the Middle East, this change in American interests comes as the region itself is in the midst of its greatest upheaval in half a century, generating an all-out battle for power among its major players. The region's governments, worried about Washington's growing disregard and what it means for their own security, are working hard to draw us back in. And the result is that the United States exists in a kind of Middle Eastern purgatory. We're too distracted by the crises in the region to move and shift our attention to other global priorities, but we're not invested enough to move the region in a better direction. It's kind of the worst of both worlds, and it exacts a heavy price for us and for the region. It sows uncertainty among America's Middle Eastern partners, and that encourages them to act in risky and aggressive ways. Just think about Saudi Arabia's bloody campaign in Yemen. It deepens the American public's frustration with the region's endless turmoil, as well as with our efforts to address it. And it diverts resources that could otherwise be devoted to confront a rising China and a revanchist Russia. And all the while, because we are unclear about the limits of our own commitments in the Middle East, the United States risks getting dragged into yet another Middle Eastern conflict, as we almost were this summer with Iran. So it's time for policymakers and strategists in Washington to put an end to wishful thinking. Wishful thinking about our ability to establish order on our own terms. Wishful thinking about our ability to transform self-interested and short-sighted regional actors into reliable allies. If we don't adjust our goals and means 
to our new reality, we risk more of the chaos and calamity that we're seeing now. So we have to make some choices, and they are going to be ugly choices, to craft a strategy that will protect the most important American interests in the region without sending us back into purgatory. And that's what I want to try and outline for you tonight. How do we think about those tough choices? So I said that the Middle East matters less to the United States than it used to. And so the US can do less if we do it wisely. Why do I think that's true? I think there are three factors that have made doing less in the Middle East both more alluring and more possible. And we can recognize them if we think about the reasons that drew the United States into the region in the middle of the last century. The first factor is that interstate conflicts, big wars between state armies, those directly threatened American interests in the past in the Middle East, and they've largely been replaced by sub-state security threats. During the Cold War, state-based threats pushed the US to play a major role in the region, and that was a role that involved not only ensuring the stable supply of energy to Western markets, but also working to prevent the spread of communist influence, tamping down the Arab-Israeli conflict to help stabilize friendly states. And these efforts were largely successful. Beginning in the 1970s, the United States nudged Egypt out of the Soviet camp, oversaw the first Arab-Israeli peace treaty, and solidified American hegemony in this region. And despite challenges from Iran after the 1979 revolution and from Saddam Hussein's Iraq in the 1990s, <coughs> American dominance in the Middle East was never seriously in question after that Camp David Treaty between Israel and Egypt. Thanks to all these efforts, the chances of deliberate interstate war in the Middle East are perhaps lower now than at any point in the last 50 years. Today, the chief threat in the Middle East is not a state-on-state -state conflict, but the growing sub-state violence that is spilling across borders. And that's a challenge that is much harder to solve from outside the region. The terrorism, the civil war plaguing the Middle East have spread easily in a permissive environment. The permissive environment is weak, repressive states. The United States, though, cannot fundamentally alter that environment without investing in state building, in post-conflict states, or in arm wrestling autocratic states to open up. And that's a degree of investment that's far beyond what the American public or broader foreign policy considerations would allow. And so until regional governments are ready to change course, the US really can't hope to do much to address the roots of regional instability. Now, some of this chaos directly threatens American partners, and that means we can't ignore it. Jordan's vulnerability skyrocketed in 2014 as hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees fled there. And that's why the United States has ramped up its economic assistance to Jordan. Saudi Arabia's critical energy infrastructure has proved dangerously exposed. And that's why the United States has deepened its support there as well. But today, the primary threats to these partner states are internal. The primary threats are dysfunctional state-led economic systems and unaccountable governments that are failing to meet the needs or aspirations of a large, young, reasonably healthy, globally connected generation. Change will have to come from the Arab states themselves. And although the United States can and should support reformers within Arab societies, something that I have been working on for nearly 20 years, I don't believe the US can drive this kind of transformation from the outside. Now, even as the Middle East problems have become less susceptible to constructive outside influence, our global interests have changed, most of all when it comes to Asia. 
You know, for decades, U.S. policymakers debated whether China could rise peacefully and join a global order where the rules had been defined by the United States and other Western governments. But China's behavior, especially its insistence that its neighbors accept its territorial claims in the South China Sea or its control over Hong Kong, um, this has led many to worry that China cannot rise peacefully into the US-led global order. Both President Obama and President Trump recognized that Asia has become more important to American grand strategy and that China has become more challenging and competitive. When President Obama announced what became known as his rebalance to Asia, he said, after a decade in which we fought two wars that cost us dearly in blood and treasure, the United States is turning our attention to the vast potential of the Asia Pacific region. And then in addition, Russia has generated growing concern ever since its invasion of Crimea in 2014. And fears about European security and stability have pushed the Middle East even further down the list of America's global priorities. So the region's problems have become less amenable to American fixes. The region itself is relatively less important and other regions are more important. And then we have the third factor, which is oil. Now, oil is the fuel that first drew the United States into the Middle East after World War II. Middle Eastern oil remains a crucial commodity in the global economy, but it is weakening as a driver of American policy. One reason is the more abundant global supply, and that includes domestic production here in the US. Another is a widely anticipated stall in global demand for fossil fuels. Technological advances, concerns about greenhouse gas emissions are leading many countries to shift away from fossil fuels and toward renewables. And the result of these trends is a Middle East that's just less central to global energy markets and less able to control global energy prices. And that means that the United States can afford to worry less doesn't mean it doesn't worry at all, but to worry less about protecting the flow of energy from this region to the world. Now, just because the Middle East matters less doesn't mean that it doesn't matter at all. Many of the things that are important to the United States that were important when the US first became involved in the Middle East matter today. The US should still care about protecting freedom of navigation in the region's strategic maritime passages. Um, the US should still care about preventing oil producers or troublemakers from suddenly turning off the tap. The US should still care about containing regional bullies who want to redraw state borders or launch terrorist attacks. The question is how crucial are these priorities relative to other priorities? And how much should the United States invest in them? And the problem is that in the face of these rising challenges from China, from Russia, the opportunity cost for the United States in keeping its military and economic and diplomatic energy focused on the Middle East, that opportunity cost is growing higher with every passing month. Now, the Defense Department has already scaled back US military capabilities in the Middle East in order to redirect resources to the increasing threats in Europe and Asia. And that's in response to analysis undertaken by National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster and Defense Secretary Mattis in the first year of the Trump administration. How do we build a new strategy for American engagement in the Middle East, one that recognizes that its relative importance has declined, but that there are still things there that we should be prepared to invest in. Well, the first thing that is required of us is to recognize a painful reality. And as a Middle Eastern specialist, it's painful for me. But what is good for the United States in the Middle East now may not be what is best for the Middle East itself. 
Now, the current administration seems surprisingly comfortable watching repressive rulers consolidate power in certain countries, watching brutal armed forces and militias displace civilians and destroy cities in other countries. But how much is the United States willing to invest to push back against dictatorial repression or ethnic cleansing? In the 1990s and early 2000s, in a world of unchallenged American hegemony, we could do these things relatively cheaply because nobody was opposing us who could match our capabilities. Now we have other priorities. Now we have regional actors who are feeling intent on doing what they think best achieves their own security. And so we have to be disciplined and clear-eyed about what it would take to make change, and we have to weigh the trade-offs. We need to right-size our objectives to match the resources that we are able and willing to commit. And then once we've decided on the limits of those interests, we need to clearly communicate those limits to other countries. There was a summit at Camp David in 2015 between President Obama and the leaders of the governments in the Arab Gulf, the six Gulf Cooperation Council governments. And President Obama alarmed these regional leaders when he told them that the US would protect them from external threats, but pointedly declined to mention protecting them against internal threats. I think President Obama was right to put the onus on Gulf states to address their own internal challenges and to make clear that the United States doesn't have a dog in most of their family fights, so to speak. But the fact is that some of our regional partners in this current uncertain environment are looking to try and draw us into advancing their own pet projects or extending their own influence. They're trying to convince the US government that their priorities are really our priorities. But there's no reason why the United States should back some of these projects. Whether we're talking about the United Arab Emirates support for the militia leader Khalifa Haftar in Libya, or the current Israeli ruling party's aspiration to annex territory in the West Bank, the region is in turmoil and Okay, we might not always choose to invest what it would take to make it better, but we can at least avoid contributing to what will make it worse. When President Obama and then President Trump chose to quietly back the Saudi Emirati intervention into the Yemeni civil war, for example, I think we made things worse. President Trump has done the same in Israel-Palestine and now in Syria as well. Taking responsibility for a new, more limited American strategy in the Middle East also means that we need clear guidelines about where the United States will and won't use military force. Now, I left the Obama administration in January of 2012. That was in the relatively early days of the Syrian civil war. So I watched from outside government as my former colleagues for three years seemed unable to decide whether American policy really backed the ouster of Bashar al-Assad or whether the United States had any obligation in Syria as they had decided it did in Libya to protect civilians from armed assault by their own government. And while the Obama administration debated its role in Syria, money and weapons and ultimately fighters flowed in from all across the region to fund all kinds of militias with all kinds of competing goals. The region's governments lined up on various sides of the conflict and it quickly became a proxy war. Half of Syria's population was displaced from their homes. Tens of thousands of refugees fled into Europe, causing upheaval in European politics. Millions of refugees fled into Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan. And finally, when it became clear beyond doubt that the United States was not going to put its thumb decisively on the scale against Assad, the Russians came in to support him and prevent him from being overthrown. The chemical attacks, the barrel bombings, the killing, the displacement all escalated. And it was only ISIS's emergence from Syria and its drive into central Iraq that roused President Obama to act. 
In all the back and forth during those three years over what US policy aims in Syria should be, while the US was backing UN calls for a negotiated solution, no one in the US government was willing to say to the Syrian opposition that the cavalry was not going to come. It's imperative that we not repeat that mistake, that we not avoid the tough choices that we face in this region, and that we communicate those choices clearly to regional actors. Now, since a less engaged United States will leave more of the business of Middle Eastern security to partners in the region, it also has to rethink how it works with those partners. For example, when it comes to counterterrorism, the US military is fond of talking about a by, with, and through approach. Have any of you heard that phrase? By, with, and through approach to working with local partners. General Joseph Votel, who until very recently was the commander in chief of US Central Command, which includes the Middle East, explained that this means military operations are led by our partners, state or non state, with enabling support from the United States or US led coalitions, and through US authorities and partner agreements. So that basically is what we've done with the Iraqis in pushing back on ISIS. It's what we did with the Kurdish-led Syrian Defense Forces in Northeast Syria. But that model only works if the partners on the ground share Washington's priorities, right? Consider the Defense Department's brief doomed program to train and equip rebels in Syria earlier in the war. Now, President Obama was mistrustful of these partners, fearing that they might drag the United States into a war against Bashar al-Assad. So he was unwilling to provide sophisticated support to these fighters. He gave them light weapons and some basic training. The US military instructed its partners to prioritize attacking ISIS over attacking regime forces that were shelling their hometowns. And they eventually changed course and that stalled the campaign against ISIS. That's why the US ended up sending in, in its own special forces to work alongside the Syrian Kurds. Now the Kurdish leadership always knew that the United States wouldn't stay in Syria forever, that we were only there to defeat ISIS. That much at least we did make clear. So they knew that ultimately they would probably have to cut a deal with Damascus. Now, had the American withdrawal decision been made in an organized manner, the US might have been able to support Kurdish leaders in negotiating an autonomy deal with Bashar al-Assad. That would be messy, it would be unsatisfying, but it would be a decent effort to preserve stability in Northeast Syria, to preserve lives, and to prevent a power vacuum that would allow ISIS to rebuild. And instead, we're getting the opposite of all those things. It's also important that the United States see our partners in the Middle East for who they truly are and to understand their interests, not just ours. To understand that while our interests and theirs may overlap, they're not identical. To take an example, over the past years, in its hope of finding a capable Gulf Arab security partner, the US has worked with the United Arab Emirates to help build their own expeditionary and special forces modeled on ours. Secretary Mattis was so proud of the Emirati's willingness to pick up these capabilities that he called the UAE the Little Sparta. More recently, Little Sparta has used that expeditionary capability in Yemen to occupy a strategic island called Socotra. It's used that expeditionary capability in Libya to carry out air operations on behalf of General Heftar at the same time that Washington was trying to halt his offensive. So we need to be careful about what weapons we're selling, what training we're providing, what signals we are sending in these relationships. Now a clear-eyed approach also requires accepting that China or Russia or both will likely gain more of a footing in the Middle East as the US pulls back. Should we worry about that? I think that's a big question. Right now, 
based on what I see, I would say neither power is likely to make a real bid for hegemony in this region, to try and replace the United States. So far, China's established itself by stepping gingerly around regional conflicts, keeping very balanced relationships, seeking trade and friendship, and avoiding taking any sides. And if you look at Russia's involvement in Syria, you see, yes, a ruthless willingness to back Bashar al-Assad but also a very crass view of power and money, where Kremlin-linked mercenaries have fought for Assad and in return gained lucrative oil profits. And that suggests that regional governments who make friends with Moscow will face a very strict quid pro quo, not the kind of partnership that the US has traditionally provided. So I do think it's possible to um, do less in the Middle East and see Russia and China making friends there without worrying too much about their intentions. I also think it comes down to trade-offs. If the United States can't compete effectively with Russia in Europe or with China in the Pacific, then it doesn't matter if we compete with them in the Middle East. Okay, all of the recommendations I just discussed were about what the US should do less of. But there are issues in the region that still greatly concern the US. Those who prefer that Washington just withdraw from the region and walk away, as President Trump said the other day, let them fight it out. I think that view entirely underestimates how dangerous the resulting power vacuum would be. The United States does have important interests in this region to protect. So what are those? Well, one of them is sustaining freedom of navigation for the US Navy and for global commercial traffic through passages like the Strait of Hormuz, the Bab al-Mandeb, the Suez Canal. Now, fortunately, keeping these maritime passages open isn't just an American priority, it's a global priority because a huge proportion of global trade goes through these waterways. Outside the Persian Gulf, um, there are parties across Asia and Europe that share our objective there. And we have help in fighting piracy and securing these waterways. Fighting terrorism also remains a priority for the United States to secure the American people, to secure American forces stationed abroad, to secure American partners. The US needs to prevent new threats from emerging in the Middle East. And I think it's quite clear 10 days in that the most dangerous consequence of the way in which President Trump is withdrawing American forces from Northeast Syria is that it provides a golden opportunity for ISIS to regroup, rebuild, and start carrying out attacks again. Finally, I think the United States still has an interest in seeing its main partners, even the imperfect ones, stable and secure. And it needs to weigh investments in security cooperation and economic aid accordingly. And we also need to be sure that problems in the Middle East, even when they are confined within a single state's borders for a time, don't spill over to neighbors or to neighboring regions. That to me is a lesson of the wars of the 1990s. It's the lesson of Yugoslavia. Uh, and it's a lesson that President Obama failed to apply to the Syrian civil war. Preventing conflicts from spreading doesn't mean launching all out military intervention, but it does sometimes require the US to actively contain the fighting. And sometimes like we did in Bosnia, to use force in coercive diplomacy designed to bring a civil war to a swifter end. Now ultimately, lasting stability in the Middle East, as I said, will only come when there's a change in the relationship between the rulers and the ruled. That will require governments that give citizens a reason to buy into the system instead of encouraging them to work around it through corruption or leave it behind through emigration or to try and tear it down through violence. But as I said before, that's a change that can't be driven by the United States without far more carrots and sticks than we're prepared to deploy. 
U.S. policymakers should support those in the region who are proposing constructive solutions. It should work to shape the environment in which governments make their choices about how to govern. And it can work with others who have a stake in addressing the roots of Middle Eastern instability, like our allies in Europe. I think there are some other goals that, at least for now, the United States will have to give up on. I think for now, we have to abandon the prospect of a negotiated settlement to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't say that happily. I've spent a lot of years on that issue. I think that we do need to keep working to constrain the worst impulses of both the Israelis and the Palestinians as they deal with their ongoing conflict and as they deal with very difficult domestic politics on both sides. But I don't think we're going to get that peace deal we've been hoping for, not anytime soon. I think we still need to care about Iran's nuclear program. The nuclear deal negotiated by President Obama didn't put an end to Iran's destabilizing behavior. It didn't permanently end its nuclear ambitions. But it did offer meaningful, verifiable constraints on Iranian nuclear activity. And it did that better than the Trump administration's bluster backed by so-called maximum pressure. I think the United States needs to continue efforts to roll back Iran's bad behavior, both alone and with partners, and hopefully negotiate a return to the constraints on Iran's nuclear activity. Now, the American dominance of the Middle East hasn't always been about having a heavy military footprint. That's something we've gotten used to since the 1991 Gulf War. But you know, the United States negotiated Israeli-Egyptian peace without having hundreds of thousands of boots on the ground. Influence doesn't always come from the threat or use of force. Still, there's no question that American involvement in the Middle East during this period of heavy military engagement over the last two decades has been painful. It's been ugly for the United States and for the region. Still. It has become the devil we know. Um, the region continues to generate risks and things that matter to us. And the result is that many American policymakers have grown accustomed to the costs associated with this heavy emphasis on military force and very reluctant to change course. And that's why you hear, in addition to alarm about the consequences of our precipitous withdrawal from Syria, you also hear some folks in Washington saying, no, 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 we need to stay there. We have to, you know, if we're there, we can push back on Iran. If we're there, we can solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, and so on and so forth. Um, it's the devil they know. Now, I understand the calls to pull back. And indeed, as I've said to you tonight, there are reasons for the United States to do less in the Middle East. But we have to build a strategy, a strategy that matches our aspirations. Pulling out our troops, as we have in Syria, or pulling out our aid, as we did with the Palestinian Authority, or pulling out our political support, as we have with the idea of a two-state solution, that's a recipe for chaos and unpleasant consequences. And if ISIS rebuilds, and again targets American cities or European cities, this kind of sudden withdrawal is also a recipe for sending us right back into the Middle East. And that, I think, is a future that we all want to avoid. So I'm not leaving you with any easy answers. The choices are ugly, they're uncomfortable, they're unsatisfying. But that's what real-world foreign policy often leaves us with. And it's time for the United States to begin the difficult work of getting out of purgatory. So with that, let me end and look forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, and if you wouldn't mind, just please introduce yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm Eric Young. and. Um, let me see, actually, and, and Turkey probably represents a good example within this, but ISIS and actually Al Qaeda too, year after year, have said that their biggest fear 
is essentially Thomas Jefferson. That is, their biggest fear is a secular state mm -hmm. with human rights for all. They understand how to fight, you know, a Shia state or a Christian state, or, you know, mm -hmm. but they're, they're most threatened by that. And it was really a shame when Turkey went from a secular state to this kind of dictatorial mm -hmm. state. And uh, push it. well, anyway, so, so the question. my question basically is that wouldn't that be the most effective way actually to fight ISIS and many of these smaller wars is through finding ways to encourage that within the different countries, like yeah. allowing Christians and Kurds and, right. Understand, and, yes. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be? Uh, Thank you. Way? So. You know, this idea that democracy is an antidote to terrorism is something that's pretty powerful for Americans, right? Because although we have our own challenges and cynicism about our democracy, um, we do know that it allows us to solve our conflicts peacefully rather than violently when we do it right, right? Um, and that's why we need to preserve our democracy and preserve our ability to disagree with each other peacefully and not have a zero-sum game. So in principle, this makes all the sense in the world, right? In practice, historically, you have terrorism in democratic societies as well as in non-democratic societies. Some of the worst terrorism of the 1970s came from German radicals and Japanese radicals, and by the way, some American radicals too, for those of you who remember the 60s and 70s. Um, and so it doesn't seem to bear out in practice that democratic societies have some kind of uh, vaccine <laughs> against generating terrorism. Um, so that's, that's the first part of the trouble. The second part of the trouble is that um, when the United States goes into the Middle East the way President George W. Bush did in 2004 and says, well, we think that the reason that you're generating all this violent extremism is because you have autocratic governments and therefore if you change your way of doing business at home, you know, that'll be better for us. That doesn't tend to be a very persuasive argument for them, right? Please put yourselves out of a job in order to deal with our security threat, right? And Bush ultimately, although, you know, I, I do think he pushed um, in certain ways for positive change, he did not manage to persuade any of those dictators to put themselves out of a job, and, and ultimately he decided he was happier with them. Um, that drive of his for democracy in the Middle East lasted about two years. The final problem um, is that if we look at what does give terrorists um, that safe haven, it's less about autocracy than it is about vacuums. Vacuums of authority, um, vacuums of economic, effective you know, economic activity where people don't have livelihoods. Um, and um, yes, I mean, vacuums of autonomy, I, I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but I'm saying it's part of a broader set of issues. And so, yes, we do need to look at rights and freedoms, but we also need to look at economic development. We need to look at social structures. We need to look at the role of women. There's a lot of evidence that societies where women are less equal also have more violence, including more terrorism. Um, and so we have to see it as part of a constellation, I guess, of political and social factors. Um, and these are things that, you know, all around the world, we try to promote economic development, we try to promote gender equality, we try to promote political freedom, but it's a game of millimeters, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, hi. My name is Carmen. I'm a Berkeley student here at UNLV. Um, Great. It's a bit of a multi pronged question, but yes or no. Would you confidently say we're in a multipolar world now? Ooh, what a challenging question. Um, or approaching one? I think we are approaching one, okay. yes. Um, with Russia, primarily, we, I'm not going to bring China into that, but if Russia is uh, funding proxy groups in the Middle East and elsewhere, um, you talked about Obama's position on um, 
defending them against external threats mm -hmm. and not internal ones. Mm -hmm. Would you consider Russia's funding of proxy groups present within those geographic locations external threats? Oh, that's an excellent question. So we don't have any evidence that the Russians are funding local militias against our partner governments, like against the Saudis or against the Israelis. Um, what Russia has done is it has backed the Assad government and the Assad government's core allies, which are both a state, Iran, and a non-state Iranian partner, Hezbollah, yes. right? So the Russians are indirectly supporting Hezbollah. They're not providing it with weapons or money. It doesn't need their weapons or money. Um, but they provide it with cover, air cover, mostly, to fight on behalf of Assad in Syria. Um, and you know, so from that perspective, the United States, as part of its commitment to Israel's security, is committed to combat Hezbollah activity. OK, so where is the United States not withdrawing from in Syria? It's a very interesting point. Um, the United States had presence in Syria in two places, in the northeast, where it was fighting with the, this Kurdish-led militia against ISIS, and down on the Jordanian-Iraqi-Syrian border, we have a base with a couple hundred special forces in it called Atanf, in a town called Atanf. Why are we there? because it's on a major highway between Baghdad and Damascus that is a, a road that the Iranians and Hezbollahis have been trying to use as a supply route to bring weapons to Hezbollah. So we're there basically to stop Hezbollah from getting more sophisticated missile technology in particular, and that's the place I think we're not gonna withdraw from. Because they're here. Because? They're here and elsewhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, Follow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very quickly, because other folks have their hands uh, sure. up. Yeah. Um, Afghanistan and the Taliban. Yeah. And the lack, of the government, and lack of communication between them. Um, would you say that that's part of that? That's an area we would continue to um, mm. retract from. We are there, and that's because our NATO allies invoked Article Five. Uh, to support our self-defense after 9-11, right? So they all went to Afghanistan with us. They've been there with us, and others as well. Um, and so I don't think that we face the same kind of, well, God, if we don't do it, you know, ain't, nobody's going to do it, kind of dynamic that we face in the Middle East. And when the Afghan government says, you know, we need you to do X, Y, and Z, they're not only saying it to us. They're saying it to 50-odd countries. Does that help? Yeah. OK, sir. Yeah, you mentioned allies as well as Kurds. Now, are the French, Germans, Italians, anyone else involved in Syria? And aren't their interests greater than ours in terms of the whole refugee issue mm. and the involvement of Turkey, which you know, is right part of their environment directly. Right. right, so why shouldn't they do it without us? Are they? Are they doing <laughs> anything? Um, well, they have been with us. Uh, in fact, when President Trump made his dramatic announcement a week ago Sunday, um, we had UK forces on the ground with, patrolling with our guys in the zone where the Turks were about to begin their incursion. And they didn't know. The UK did not know that we were doing this. OK, so um, yes, they, they've been there with us. They've been fighting alongside us, the, the Brits and the Australians in particular, but others mainly with air power as part of the broader fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, we and the Brits and some others have been funding civilian assistance to these populations in northeast Syria. And so they've had civilian personnel on the ground as well. And so did we. Um, so they evacuated. Yes, all of them have been evacuated. And not only the, the sort of economic and governance assistance, but all of the humanitarian assistance, medical, refugees, support, tents, food, water, everything. All of the international organizations 
that were providing that assistance in northeast Syria have evacuated, including you know, doctors without borders who go everywhere. Um, why? Because there's shelling and aerial assaults. Uh, and they, they can't keep their people safe. So it's, um, it is not a situation in which anyone who was not already there would contemplate going in, right? Um, and it's also a situ situation where because the United States appears to have given the Turks tacit permission at a minimum to go in and do this, um, no one has any leverage to make space to stabilize the ground, right? To get the Turks to stop fighting, to keep the Russian and Syrian forces from encroaching in these Kurdish areas. I mean, nobody's got the leverage to do it. We had the leverage with, you know, what were really just less than 2,000 people on the ground. Uh, and we gave that leverage away, basically. <laughs> Thank you so much for your perspective on this complicated issue. Uh, we may have to have you back very soon for chapter it would two. Be my <laughs> Thank all of you for joining us tonight and for your great questions. I hope you can come back in two weeks on the 30th, same time, exact same place. Uh, we'll keep up a foreign policy theme. Our colleague Danny Bahar will be back out from Brookings, and Danny's uh, giving a lecture on migrants and refugees, are they holding us back or pushing us forward? And that will be with a global perspective, not just a U.S. question. So uh, promises to be another timely and informative lecture. So please join us if you can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.